and welcome to everybody. We really appreciate you all joining us today. Today we will be doing an electric vehicle heavy duty uh, battery electric webinar and our host eight group that are, that's helping to deliver that is uh, Motive. Today's presenters are going to be uh, John Feltz, uh, who is the sales representative from Northern California and the Northwest for the United States for uh, Motive, and Isaac Stratford, who is the sales associate engineer also with Motive. So thank you to our sponsors, our many sponsors in Sacramento Queen City sponsors. Without these sponsors, we wouldn't be able to move forward with these presentations. So if you gentlemen are ready to jump in, John and Isaac, I will stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you guys. Excellent. Thank you for that intro. I appreciate it. And uh, Tim and Clean Cities in general, thank you for having Motive today. Uh, we're really happy to be here. As Tim mentioned, I'm the Northwest rep for Motive Power Systems. That means I take the top half of California all the way up to Anchorage and all the way from the coast out to the Dakotas. Um, we have the rest of the country covered, so uh, they just picked me to be the spokesman today. Anyway, uh, today I'm going to take you on a little tour of our Stockton, California service facility, and I'll be walking you through the life cycle of building an electric chassis, which is then made into a mid-duty electric vehicle. Uh, these are battery electric, as Tim mentioned. Uh, some things that I want to impose on potential customers, spec riders, technicians, or anyone that would be using any type of funding, like HFIP or Carl Moyer or CCAT up in Sacramento, uh, I, I want you to pay attention to a couple things that I point out because it'll help um, it'll help you when certifying the vehicle to uh, receive that actual funding. Uh, so with that, let me get this video started. And John, I think we also have a poll for folks. Yeah, are we going to do the poll beforehand? Did you want yeah. to launch that first? Okay, yep. go ahead Just and launch the, the poll. I'll prep the video and uh, go from there. Um, so that poll, let me check. Uh, the, the poll is going to include, you'll see it, of course. We just want to know what type of customer you are. Are you a, um, do you have plans to deploy electric vehicles in the next year? Uh, do you have plans to deploy an electric bus or truck? Are you a truck or bus dealer? Are you a truck or bus builder or none of the above? And Is that all right? We'll give that a couple more seconds. All right, so a good half of the group is none of the above. We've got a couple of builders and a couple of dealers, and 27%, a good quarter of you, are looking to deploy a bus or a truck in the next year. That's excellent. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and move on to the movie. Hello, my name is Joanna Hamblin, and I run marketing at Motive Power Systems. At Motive, we're committed to freeing fleets from fossil fuels by providing a seamless pathway to electrification. Since our founding in 2009, Motive has over 100 electric medium duty truck, bus, and specialty vehicles on the road, operating at over 99% uptime, with over 1 million miles among some of the largest fleets in North America, including USPS, Airmark, Bimbo Bakeries, and several school districts. Our backlog is nearing over 200 vehicles with over 50% coming from existing customers. Our partners include Ford and BMW, just to name a few. We're focused on sustainability and business results, enabling fleets to realize up to 85% operation maintenance cost savings, as well as providing operators with a healthier, smoother, and quieter driving experience without polluting the communities that they serve. Motive is headquartered in the San Francisco Bay Area in Foster City with a manufacturing facility in Hayward and a brand new service center right here in Stockton. Let me take you on a quick tour. 
First up will be my colleague Lupe Arrodondo, who is our vehicle support manager, and he'll share about what we do in our facility. Come with me. Hi, my name is Lupe Arredondo, Vehicle Support Manager here at Motive Power Systems. Thank you for joining us here at our Stockton facility. At this location, we perform a number of exciting activities from pre-delivery inspections, or PDI, manufacturing and engineering prototype validation, but more importantly, we serve as a service center for our many customers here in Northern California. With that, we invite you to take a tour of our operation, led by John Feltz, our Northern California and Northwest sales representative. Hi, I'm John Feltz with Motive Power Systems, and today I'm going to show you around our shop and show you the life cycle of building an electric vehicle. We'll start off over here with one of our fresh chassis directly from Ford. Now these chassis come to us currently with the motor and transmission and all the other emissions producing products still attached to the vehicle. We will decontent this, take them all out, sell off the parts, and make this into an electric vehicle powered by motive. Along the way here, we'll show you the batteries that we put into this vehicle. These are BMW batteries. They are commercially available, tested with millions of miles on them. Here's two of the batteries. We'll actually be putting three batteries into the chassis, but first we have to decontent that chassis, and I'll show you what that looks like here. When we take out the motor, the exhaust system, the gas tank, all of those emission producing parts, and this is what we end up with. We have a fully decontented chassis where we can start electrifying this particular chassis into the piece that I'm gonna show you next. Here you will find a Ford F59 chassis that's been electrified by Motive. I'd like to point out that the VIN number is clearly displayed here. It's a good thing to keep track of that for uh, when it comes time to certify for your funding or grants if you are using those to build these vehicles. We have one battery here, the same BMW battery that I showed you before, a second and a third battery here, equating to 127 kilowatt hours on this particular vehicle. Those three batteries feed into the adaptive battery controller here. That is a motor product. Uh, which then, of course, feeds the motor. Always important to remember to take pictures of or document the serial number for the motor, again, for certifying for any sort of funding that you're applying for. So we also have an onboard charger and an inverter to invert the DC back to AC to drive the motor, and that is our electrified chassis. From this point, the chassis will go to an upfitter, be it Winnebago, Rockport, Utilimaster, or any of our other partners, bodybuilders. It can be built into a work truck, a school bus, a shuttle bus, a step-in van. This will be a step-in van. And I'd like to show you an example of one of our other vehicles. These two vehicles are here because this is our pre-delivery inspection location in Stockton, California. These two vehicles are going to Community Resource Project in Sacramento. This is a company that does energy efficiency upgrades for disadvantaged communities. So not only are they doing energy efficient upgrades, they are doing it with electric vehicles. And these two will add on to their fleet of nine vehicles. And they are here for the pre-delivery inspection. And I'm gonna pass you on to Lupe, who will explain what that entails. After a chassis completes its journey from the upfitter to the body manufacturer, the electrified vehicle then goes through a pre-delivery inspection with multiple checkpoints such as quality, functionality, and verifying that the product meets the customer's requirements. From performance to operational functions, all motor vehicles are fully tested and validated before they reach the end user. This concludes our tour of the Stockton facility. For more information about Motive, our products, customers, and partners, please visit our website at MotivePS.com. One of our most frequently asked questions would be who are Motive's customers? And our customers range uh, from in, uh, commercial companies such as Bimbo Bread, um, Ameripride, 
and such schools as uh, Twin Rivers Unified Sacramento uh, City School District, um, mostly schools and uh, delivery type uh, vehicles. Bear with me one second. Um, second question, uh, what's the difference about how Motive builds vehicles? We're one of the few mid-duty manufacturers that build from the ground up, if not the only one. Uh, that allows us to be um, Ford EQVM qualified, which means Ford approves of everything that we've done. So they will also back their warranty along with our warranty. Um, why do we use the BMW batteries? The BMW batteries are, they've been on the road for millions of miles. There's a huge market demand for lithium and it's, you know, it's been strong. So we could make our own batteries, but we prefer to let another company like BMW do all the testing and uh, provide us with proven batteries. All right. Um, a lot of people, of course, will ask what's the range. Typically on these vehicles, it's from 150 to 125 miles on a full charge. You can opportunity charge, of course. And um, we do have to point out that driver behavior is very important on this. Before we move on to Isaac, I wanted to uh, mention one more thing, especially to any techs out there or spec writers. Uh, one thing I was trying to point out uh, on the chassis in the vehicle is to make sure to record all VIN numbers and um, all serial numbers along the build as much as you can because you will have to prove that that vehicle has those parts in it and that it is a, a certifiable electric vehicle. All right, with that, I'm gonna pass on to Mr. Isaac. Awesome, thank you, John, and thank you for uh, showing us the uh, video and giving us the tour of the new uh, Stockton location. It's really awesome to be able to, to show you guys um, this new facility. I think it's really our, our unveiling um, um, of it to, to kind of uh, the, the wider industry. Um, I'm, uh, my name is Isaac Straffold. I'm a sales applications engineer for um, Motive. So I assist the sales team um, kind of with subject matter expertise, but I also handle everything to do with electric vehicle charging infrastructure, which will be the topic of my presentation in one second. I believe before that we have a quick poll question for you that should show up on your screen soon. So we really want to know what uh, what types of vehicles are are are, uh, are you interested in? Um, Motive provides a wide set of uh, electric vehicles crossing several different industries: shuttle buses, school buses, delivery vehicles, um, and actually a trolley bus as well. Um, so please indicate your interest; it'll be helpful for us. Great, looks like we have a lot of people from the delivery sector and a lot of people interested in other. Um, one category not mentioned here is our specialty vehicles with uh, Winnebago as well. So those of you may be interested in those vehicles or you may be um, technology partners or interested in the EV charging side of things. Um, so without further ado, that is something I will present on. So this presentation is going to primarily focus on um, EVSE um, and kind of basic terminology for all electric vehicle charging and then a bit into kind of the smart charging um, side of things and, and, the, and the value adds for having a networked um, station and a networked installation at your site. I'm not going too much into the true infrastructure side of things with utilities, um, transformers, switch gear and all that. Um, but that is something that you can feel free to come directly to us for and uh, we will, uh, we're happy to give you more information on that. So first off, um, good to address the, uh, the important terminology um, when it comes to uh, electric vehicle charging. So a term you'll hear thrown around a lot is EVSE, um, which stands for electric vehicle supply equipment. And this really refers to all the equipment you need to actually charge the vehicle and deliver power from an electricity source, you know, basically coming out of the wall or coming from the grid um, to the actual vehicle um, to get it charging. So in the diagram below, the EVSE really is um, either charging station, be that the uh, AC charging side or the DC charging side, 
the plug, the connector, the pedestal, and any cord um, handling or retention systems as well. And it's kind of a very useful term when you get into more complicated setups on the uh, DC fast charging side to help define um, what you need to charge a vehicle. EVSE is different from the charging or charge station. Um, this term is typically used to refer to just the station itself. Um, it doesn't even technically include the cord set. So in our AC charging example, that gray box, the charging station provided by Clipper Creek would be our charge station in this and then the DC fast charging station um, in the DC example as well. The onboard charger, um, occasionally acronymized to OBC, um, refers to the AC to DC converter on board the actual vehicle itself. So the onboard charger is on board the uh, vehicle. And this is basically um, a uh, inverter um, from AC to DC. So it is not needed for the DC charging side, which is why you will see that um, that uh, connection there that's going to the batteries um, does not have an onboard charger in the way. It's primarily designed to convert um, the AC waveform from the grid to flat DC for the, uh, for the batteries as well. Um, and then J1772 is another common term, and this is actually an SAE standard, um, a kind of an overarching standard for how the um, electric vehicle supply equipment connects to, um, communicates with, and actually ultimately charges the electric vehicle as well. And so you'll hear J1772 referred to um, you're primarily used to refer to the connector of the vehicle that's being plugged into the vehicle, but um, it, actually, uh, it actually is an entire standard set. And so the connector itself um, is called by another name, which I re colloquially refer to as J-plug there. Charge, electric vehicle charging is fundamentally broken down into three levels, level one, two, and three. Um, and this kind of encompasses current electric vehicle charging um, in the industry. There are um, kind of fringe cases that fall outside of these definitions. Um, you'll notice that there's a pretty large gap between 19.2 kilowatts and, and the level, the true level three. Um, so there is high powered level two as well, which we'll get into. Um, but really it can all be consolidated into these levels. So level one is under two kilowatts. Um, you can get away with charging a consumer or passenger car you know, a car you may own yourselves um, with this uh, charging type. But for those of you that have EVs, you know that this takes a very long time to actually charge the vehicle. Um, and for medium duty vehicles, um, or even heavy duty, but medium duty, which hits two to three times the capacity of a, of a consumer vehicle, this is basically infeasible. You will not be able to charge the vehicle in any reasonable amount of time. So we consider level one to be fundamentally inefficient for charging. Um, even even light duty, larger light duty vehicles, let alone medium duty. Kind of the standard level two charging that you'll see around, especially publicly available stations, um, is in the six to seven kilowatt range. So you'll see these stations at Walmart or Target. Um, these are pretty decent for charging passenger cars. You can get a relatively um, reasonable charge time and you can actually get these kinds of stations installed in your home as well. Um, but again, for, for, for larger electric vehicles, um, trucks and buses, especially, you know, in the medium duty space and, lar and heavy duty space, this, um, this uh, charging power is, is still not enough. Six to seven is still going to have, going to take a significantly uh, long time to charge the vehicle. So where motive really tries to lie and where we try to, what we try to use is what we call high power level two charging, which actually goes up to 19.2 kilowatts. So we really want to be ideally above 10 and 19.2 uh, is our highest capability in, uh, with AC. We find that this is a good balance between charging speed and cost um, for medium sized trucks and buses. So really our area where motive focuses is class four to six trucks and buses and 19.2 uh, is really the, the sweet spot where you can get a lot of vehicles in a depot without having to install either a whole bunch of DC fast charging stations or install a bunch of weak um, level two stations that don't allow operators to run every day like they want to. Um, a third option that we do have is level three charging via um, the CCS1 connector, which I'll define later. Um, this is also known as a DCFC or DC fast charging, and this is really 50 kilowatts and up. And uh, one thing to note is that this is actually DC straight to the batteries. So you'll notice in my last diagram, there's no onboard charger in the way. That's because the station is also the onboard charger. Um, doing that inversion natively. And so we're able to 
um, charge vehicles very quickly. Consumer cars can use this and charge in 30 minutes now. One thing to note is for two to three times the capacity of, uh, of a regular consumer car for medium duty electric, um, DC fast charging really kind of turns into DC medium speed charging. It, it, it's, not, it's not necessarily fast, but if you're returning at a you know, relatively reasonable state of charge already, say you're coming back home at 50%, um, it can definitely get you up there and get you out on your, on your next route as well. So we do have that ability, but typically we find it to be fairly cost prohibitive um, for the majority of fleets, especially in the delivery sector, but it is an option that we're compatible with. Um, in the essence of adhering to kind of the high power level two charging, um, one concept I like to explain is what we call opportunity charging. So, you know, charging to full does take about six to eight hours with high power level two charging. So that best case 19.2 kilowatt scenario. Now, um, with the range of the vehicle, which is a little over 100 miles, um, typically, uh, you know, that might not work for some fleets, but one, one concept is what we call opportunity charging, where the vehicle actually returns to the, the depot midday, especially for school buses and some shuttle buses, this is actually a very viable option and it happens typically anyway. They can charge up again on their high power level two station and, you know, get up to 150 miles, um, 150 mile range in a day. So even though that vehicle has, um, you know, a specific range capability, opportunity charging can allow fleets to get um, more bang for their buck. Um, and this is uh, a service that uh, we provide to fleets where we can do a route analysis to determine if, uh, if uh, this is a possibility for your fleet and if high power level two is a good fit. I did mention charging connectors briefly earlier. So for level two charging, we do use the J1772-2009 connector, um, commonly referred to as J-plug. Um, this connector is basically universal, especially in the United States, um, and you know, can be found on pretty much the majority of level two stations. Um, our onboard charger, ROBC, um, currently accepts and distributes 19.2 kilowatts of input, input power from uh, or via this connector from a high power um, level two charge station. Um, we also do have an option for level three DC fast charging connectors. Um, and this uses the CCS one combo. Um, there is a CCS two. So I, I just uh, try to be clear that CCS one is what we're talking about here. Um, and that connector can deliver 50 kilowatts straight to the battery packs, which is level three charging. You'll actually notice that uh, the connector for level two and the connector for level three are similar. So if you have a vehicle with a CCS1 connector, you can accept a J-plug connection as long as the vehicle has an onboard charger. And typically what we see is um, a lot of vehicles are provided with that onboard charger. So having level three, especially for consumer cars, but also for most medium duty means that you can also do level two. So for, for certain fleets, we find that they want to do a mix of a dedicated high power level two station per vehicle, as we recommend, but also have that level three um, DC fast charging station on site as well. And again, this is something that we can um, analyze with you. We'll definitely do it on a case by case and um, facilitate uh, that installation for you and, and help, help you determine what you need as well, which I'll get into a little later. Actually, I'll get into it now. Um, so there are a lot of options out there. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not necessarily an easy thing, especially for fleets who haven't done it before. And so, you know, one thing I wanna drive home is that we, we help with the entire process. Um, we help customers, you know, assess whatever they might have currently on site, see if it can work. Um, we make recommendations of, uh, of uh, EVSE as well as um, installers, and we can actually assist with full implement implementation as a turnkey service. So we are an authorized Clipper Creek reseller. We find that Clipper Creeks work really well. They're a very simple plug and place station. They just work, um, but we're happy to suggest other options as needed. Um, Clipper Creeks again are great and they do just work, but they don't really have a lot of network solutions out there. Um, and networked charging stations actually have a lot, of, um, a lot of advantages to them and they can provide a lot of benefits, which I've listed out here. So having a um, networked or smart station uh, versus kind of the plug and play station um, allows for kind of kind of four major uh, benefits and there are other benefits too um, but we find that those vary case by case depending on the fleet but these are the major ones that people really uh, try to take advantage of 
uh, namely monitoring and reporting. So once you have a smart station, you can actually gather, view, gather, and um, report on real-time charging data. So not only just see if your vehicles are charging, but um, gather data that you might need later. Um, this is typically not only a recommendation, but a requirement for um, certain fleets using um, grants, programs, or specific funding, um, sometimes for their vehicles, but primarily if they're funding their charging infrastructure installations. So we'll get into some funding options later, and I will explain that the majority of them do have uh, data reporting requirements. And so all network stations come with this ability in a portal that allows you to access this data, um, and it is, uh, it is very valuable to some fleets. Um, a couple of uh, other interesting things are kind of load balancing and load management. Um, and so I'll, I'll actually define this in my, in my next slide, but this is basically intelligent power sharing and balancing between the stations to avoid power consumption over a specific threshold. And so we'll get into kind of peak shaving and, and, and working with demand and what that means. But uh, it's basically a way to save money, not only on consumption costs, but actually you can right size your um, EVSE installation to determine um, if you need to, uh, if you can install more stations than what it just says on the nameplate of the station. Um, intelligent stations also provide access control. This is a fancy way of saying, you know, you can control who you, you know, who uses your station. Um, Clipper Creek has a very simple option and other stations have uh, other options. There's apps, phone apps, there's uh, um, key cards. There's a lot of different options. If you own an electric vehicle or have charged an electric vehicle um, publicly, you'll understand um, that there are a few options here, be it through the app or scanning a card or something as well. And then an uh, uh, upcoming feature as well um, that is, you know, becoming implemented is uh, ADR, automated demand response. And this is actually, you know, as opposed to load management, which is scheduled, but not communicating necessarily with anything, ADR is actually communicating directly with the utility um, to basically uh, fluctuate consumption based on demand at the time. So it's a very dynamic and intelligent system. Um, and it can actually be used to generate revenue, not just save money. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to, to network stations, and I'm happy to answer questions about that at the end of this presentation. So I mentioned load management brief, briefly. There's kind of two um, fundamental benefits to it. Um, the first one I mentioned was peak shaving. So uh, basically the concept is, uh, and you can see it in the graph, that electricity prices from the power utility become higher during certain periods of the day. You know, as people come home, they want to turn on their TVs, turn on their AC, um, or what have you, they get back from work, we're gonna see consumption on the grid go up um, and uh, that will cause prices to go up. And so with a um, smart system, you can actually shave, it's called shaving, you can shave those consumption peaks as indicated by that red line, the load after shaving, to avoid those excessive costs that come with these peaks and basically kind of intelligently charge um, to save yourself money. Uh, another primary benefit is load balancing. Um, so in certain situations, um, we find in actually a fair few situations, charging installations are typically limited by the power available at a site. So you have your, um, your breaker panel um, or your distribution center, um, and it only has so much capacity. It's just what was put in in the building. You know, It could be a 10, 20 year old building and that's just what's there. Um, so you can go through the upgrade process for that and occasionally need to work directly with the utility and incur cost or with some intelligent stations you can actually um, you know distribute power um, intelligently with potentially high power stations but throttle them as needed to stay within that bound so you'll see that you know meter with a 30 in it that is your total available capacity and these will split um, charging and uh, split power between the vehicles and actually the idea behind this is to split the most power to the vehicles that need it the most and balance out the load balance out their charging um, and you know this is primarily again to avoid inc incurring um, uh, uh, infrastructure costs um, and uh, kind of intelligently manage your power consumption as well okay I'll briefly go over um, infrastructure funding options, because this is always important. A um, couple of terms I'd like to define first. Um, on the right, I have a diagram of PG&E's EV fleet program, previously known as Fleet Ready. Um, this is a utility program. This is actually from PG&E, and they want to help fleets uh, purchase, um, or it, rather, uh, deploy electric, electric vehicles, medium duty um, truck and bus fleets. 
Um, so uh, TTM is a, is a common phrase used by utilities that refers to um, everything to the meter. So if you think about power from the utilities perspective, they are pushing it out to you. So the meter is where that gap is and TTM is all of their stuff. BTM is everything behind that. So it's that gray um, circuit breaker panel you see in your building. It's that small transformer you have on the ground and the conduit and everything. And then uh, that stuff will, will distribute power and lead to the charger and then to the uh, electric vehicle here. And so um, a lot of these programs are covering entirely the TTM costs, basically the work and the, the money the utility would have to spend to upgrade these um, back end uh, systems for you. Um, so they will cover, you know, PG&E, Southern California Edison, San Diego Gas and Electric will all cover 100% of uh, these costs for, for qualifying applicants for this program. And then they each typically also incentivize BTM stuff, stuff that they won't even own, but stuff that you will need to be able to distribute the power coming from, you know, their, their system uh, to the um, electric charging stations as well. And so PG&E provides a $4,000 per plug um, incentive for a BTM. And they'll actually give a 50% uh, rebate for the actual charging hardware, which is something that you don't typically see them funding, but they'll actually rebate that for sites located in disadvantaged communities as well. So typically uh, large vehicle deployments have been cost prohibitive from an infrastructure perspective. If the funding for the vehicles can get worked out, um, but the, the um, EVSE installation funding can't, then it's always been a problem. The utilities have realized this and they are on your side and they want you to deploy vehicles. Um, so fleets in these, in these um, service territories, but also you know, fleets in other service territories, we're seeing a lot of utilities roll out um, other programs as well to kind of assist with this stuff. So the utility is actually has vested interest um, and is basically on your side. Um, when it comes to deploying uh, electric vehicles in the medium duty space. There are also a few, actually there are many regional and state programs, way too many to list here. Um, a couple of great websites for it. Um, Cal EVIP uh, is uh, California's um, kind of uh, uh, funding tracker um, for ways you can fund your projects. I would definitely encourage you to look there. These slides will be distributed after this presentation and that hyperlink should, will work. <laughs> And then AFDC is actually a uh, federal um, website as well that lists state-by-state um, -state funding programs available to you as well. So um, between sourcing um, charging stations um, all the way up to actually determining these incentives and how to use them, we have an in-house grants and incentives funding specialist who can assist with your applications both for the electric vehicle and for the infrastructure in tandem with me. Um, you know, we're happy to handle this turnkey for customers. We are very vested in your success um, and we wanna make sure that we can get these, uh, these vehicles um, deployed and have happy customers. The essence of that, I do have a, a quick example of how we have assisted a previous customer. So Beanbow Bakeries, uh, for those of you that don't know, is a very large um, kind of bakery distribution um, organization. One of the largest in the country is Beanbow Bakeries USA. So they'll distribute Hostess, Wonder Bread, a lot of the stuff you see in the supermarket. We deployed five vehicles with them in Modesto, um, kind of end of 2019, early, early this year, um, that have been operating very successfully. Um, what we needed to do um, to facilitate deployment of those vehicles was obviously get um, electric vehicle charging infrastructure um, installed and specified at that site. What we ended up having to do is right sizing the um, EVSE to uh, avoid significant infrastructure upgrades. And as I recall, this, this actually was before the EV fleet program existed where the customer would have been the one incurring those infrastructure upgrade costs. And so we wanted to, um, we wanted to uh, ideally dodge that bullet there. And so we ended up picking um, slightly lower power stations. And this was uh, based on some initial site inspections that we had done which was not only to evaluate facility power, but really look at everything. I mean, where the vehicles are being parked, um, you know, how they, how they drive in, how they operate there, where the stations can be put, everything. Um, and that in tandem with a local electrician that we sourced on behalf of the customer, 
um, allowed us to determine that we could fit five, five stations dedicated to five vehicles at that site. And so we sourced and worked with a local electrician to provide the quote for that. We worked with the charging station vendor to provide a quote for the stations. And then we facilitated all of that and they were able to, to get those stations in um, well before the vehicles were deployed. And this is just a very simple example of something we do all the time. In tandem to that, um, on the incentives and grant side, we actually pursued and received um, a, a voucher enhancement um, rebate um, for the station installation from HFIP. Uh, so this is a program that I believe is on hold now, but uh, provides funding in tandem to uh, voucher incentives for the vehicle purchase um, actually helps incentivize the purchase of EVSEs as well. So this was something that the customer was awarded after the fact and it's like, hey, here's, you know, free money as well that helps offset the cost of those stations and that installation. As I mentioned, this site has been running phenomenally. Um, over 10,000 miles, which is a lot for such a recent deployment, um, combined with 100% uptime, we haven't seen these vehicles go down once. Um, and you know, we pretty quickly secured a repeat order from this customer for, for 20 additional vehicles, which are to be deployed this year as well. So great example of how everybody came together on this and how we were able to facilitate um, this solution for the customer. Okay, those are all the slides I have. Um, I have a few seed questions, but I actually wanna take a look at the Q&A and see where we're at. Uh, so we had one question about who we would recommend for charge management. Um, at this point, we are not um, you know, married, married to any specific organization, and I prefer to take it at, at a case-by-case -case basis. So that is definitely something you should reach out um, to us either via our website or after this webinar using, um, you know, our contact information, my contact information here. Feel free to send me an email, explain your situation, and, um, you know, we can, uh, we can definitely find someone for you. Uh, another question was, how do I know if my utility provider can provide the faster and the highest rate for DC fast charging? So that's a great question. Um, it actually comes down to first the, um, kind of the power availability at your site. So what your load center looks like, um, what your transformer is rated for, it's really something where you wanna have, if you're looking at motor vehicles, ideally you wanna have us come by and we can do an initial site inspection to determine that. But um, if you determine which DC fast charging station you, you, you want to use, um, you can provide those specifications to most electricians and, and, and they'll know and be able to provide that answer to you. But again, I would encourage that you reach out to us um, especially if you're interested in, in motor vehicles as well. Okay, that's all I see in the Q&A until more stuff gets uh, put there. But we do have a few questions just to get people thinking as well. Um, so we get asked a lot, do electric vehicles offer regenerative braking? Short answer is yes. All electric vehicles will come with regenerative braking. Anything with a motor in it, it's typically, there's typically no reason to not provide regenerative braking. Um, one thing that's unique about Motive is that this is actually uh, configurable by the owner or operator. Um, so we have uh, a uh, basically a shifter panel um, inside the vehicle next to the steering wheel um, in a similar area to where the stick shift on the traditional vehicle would be um, that, allows a that allows the operator to shift from drive and park in reverse, but also change between four different levels of regenerative braking strength is the word I use. And that basically just affects your um, distance to coast. So for those of you that have um, electric vehicles, some of them will come with two settings, kind of a normal setting where you just let off the accelerator and you start to slow down, but then a really kind of aggressive setting. And we basically have um, two levels uh, between that as well. And this really allows operators to, you know, especially in the early stages to get comfortable with the vehicle and figure out what they like. We also find that it actually has a, um, you know, direct effect on, on operations and efficiency. You know, if your load is changing dynamically, which for most delivery people it is, um, you know, once your load is, uh, is lighter, you'll want regen to go down a little bit. Um, and so you can adjust that on the fly. You don't need to stop. You don't need to do anything. It's just a button in the, um, on the dashboard. And uh, we find that operators really like it a lot. Uh, had another question come in on Q and A. Is it common practice to use local electricians on projects? We are pursuing um, uh, basically partnerships with uh, electricians, kind of, kind of that can provide a, a larger service nationwide. 
but um, it's really is case by case right now. I mean, we find that local electricians provide a pretty good, pretty good service and mainly they're just there. A lot of this stuff is on site work um, and the fleet needs to feel happy and feel like there's someone they can call um, if something goes wrong. And so I've found that local electricians are, are typically a, a great answer um, uh, for, for that issue as well. But uh, I think the question behind that is, are we willing to use kind of larger um, project, you know, engineering firms or, or large project organizations, and especially for larger deployments, yes, we, uh, we have and, and we will continue to do so. It's, it's about what the customer needs and providing them a best the best solution as quickly as possible. Another question about ambulances. Yeah, I, uh, I do get, I do get um, interest in ambulances coming, um, coming in directly occasionally. At this point, it is, um, it is not something we're pursuing and I haven't seen it being pursued anywhere else in the market. I think there are specific um, you know, regulations about it as well that make that kind of difficult, but I do hope to see one someday and it is definitely something we are set up to do um, when the time comes, the E450, uh, platform, which is the one you'll see on the right there in that picture, is a very common ambulance platform um, as well. So we would be set up to do that. Okay. I have another. I, I, I saw um, an HVIP question that cash uh definitely responded to but in case people aren't monitoring that the question is how do you keep on top of all the funding across the uh, nation and we have a, a department that does that so absolutely if if you're in a different state we just found out about one in montana that we had no idea about um because they called us um but yeah we are, we are happy to uh, help you find those wherever you may be Yep, we have a dedicated team for um, incentives, um, for, for nationwide incentives, state by state um, for the vehicles. And then we also have a dedicated team for infrastructure um, and incentives related to that as well. So again, please feel free to come to us. You know, we're very, um, you know, your success is very important to us. And we, you know, we wanna get electric vehicles out there. So we are happy to, happy to help with that. Um, another question that comes in a lot is what kind of infrastructure is needed for recharging um, if the batteries exceed their range. Um, so, you know, again, DC fast charging is available now. Um, it's, uh, it's typically, you know, cost prohibitive for certain fleets, but if we do, if we can conduct a route, route analysis for you, and if we find that you're going over, DC fast charging is kind of a back pocket solution to that where you could stop mid route for however long you can and uh, get charged into that vehicle so you can keep going for longer per day. So that opportunity charging option is there um, for fleets that want to go longer. Um, I did see a question come in about moving a relatively large payload um, and climbing elevation, about 125 mile trip. Um, this, is, uh, this is achievable depending on, what the, depending on what the route actually looks like. I would want to get information from you on exactly where you're going and what that drive looks like. I mean, we calculate hill gradients down to the, you know, tens of feet. So I want to see exactly how many hills you're hitting and what that drive looks like. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're happy to say no. Um, you know, not all routes, um, and not all applications are fit for electric vehicles yet, but, uh, you know, we would like to do due diligence on your behalf to uh, uh, determine if that's actually the case. And so you should always feel free to come directly to us. My email's right there. Feel free to just uh, shoot me one now. <laughs> Uh, another question came in, are we partnered with organizations to develop, oh, it got answered, never mind. Okay, uh, one more question that comes in a lot that I think is worth addressing, addressing is vehicle maintenance, specifically, you know, what kind of service is required for electric vehicles and uh, where is that service completed? So electric vehicles have significantly reduced uh, moving parts. I don't know if you saw in John's video, but we have a diagram and I think we're down to one, maybe two belts on the entire vehicle uh, that is actually moving, moving belts. The motor is entirely self-contained. Um, 
you know, everything, there's just very, there's just far fewer moving parts. There's far less fluids. There's no exhaust components. We basically have no items that require uh, anything but visual inspection preventative maintenance. So we do want, we do have a list and we do want people to look at specific things, but we do not have a list that says you need to replace X after X, X thousand miles or what have you. Um, it's just not applicable to electric vehicles. I mean, we've been around for you know, 10 years, we have some vehicles that have been on the road for um, five to six now. And uh, it's, it's, we, we know that it's not, uh, you know, how we've designed it, it's not something that's necessary. That being said, um, if there is a larger issue with the vehicle, we have a um, kind of a distributed service network. So we have uh, about 12, 12 to 13 technicians um, nationwide, um, you know, that are on the road um, and can diagnose a wide majority of the vehicle issues on site. Um, and then we have a facility in Stockton, as you saw in the video, we have a service center in LA, um, a manufacturing facility in Hayward, and then our HQ, which can also service vehicles, is in Foster City. So we have California pretty heavily covered, and then um, New York and Michigan are also areas that we, uh, we can service pretty quickly. But again, we do operate nationwide, and we have one of the biggest customer support teams out there. Uh, got a question about, so the electric motor, um, does it connect to the OEM driveline and differential? That's right. So we're not using um, e-axles currently at all. It's still a relatively new technology. Um, so we are uh, mounting a motor in between the frame rails and running a, um, uh, a, a drive shaft to the, to the stock Ford differential as well, which we find works, works very well um, and, and also allows users to, uh, to get to the Ford components, the chassis components, be it the wheels, tire suspension, um, axles a lot easier than if it was a, a kind of a self-contained e-axle. And for now, it's good to know that the differential and drivetrain are Ford um, warranted. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, you know, one thing that you'll see, you know, we'll talk a lot about if you come to us is we are EQVM. QVM means qualified vehicle modifier. The E does not stand for electric, but it is Ford's um, program for alternative fuel qualified vehicle modifiers and uh, believe we were the first electric. Um, so we got it in 2017 and it basically means that the uh, Ford warranty is intact. Um, so we're obviously removing all combustion related component components, but you still do have your base Ford chassis um, pretty much how they come. And so if something goes wrong with axle suspension tires, any, any Ford components, even stuff to do with the, with the cab, say on the E450, um, that can actually get serviced under under Ford warranty by a, a Ford dealership, um, if that is something that you want to do. Um, we do have customers that come, you know, existing fleets that come to us all the time for stuff that's not necessarily related to our system, be it issues with the body or the or the suspension. Um, and it is something that we, you know, both can handle ourselves and easily refer you to the proper um, Ford service provider as well. So, again, kind of a kind of a one stop shop for for you know, funding and, and charging and, and service as well. Okay, don't see any more questions in the Q&A portion. Feel free to get your last ones in now if you have any. Okay. Thank you all for taking the time to uh, listen to our webinar. Um, well, okay, thank you both very, very much. Uh, we appreciate your, uh, your, your presentation and I think we got some fantastic feedback from some of the folks that um, uh, we're on the uh, webinar and the, uh, the questions that they asked and your feedback on those questions. Um, I just wanted to then thank everybody, of course, John and Isaac again, and all of our attendees. And I wanted to give everybody a little bit of information about what's coming up. Uh, we have I've posted up on the screen right now the upcoming um, uh, webinars that we have. The next one that we have will be on uh, August the 26th, where we're doing a natural gas technician training, and it will include fuel system and even tank inspection um, training. Uh, 
on the 16th of September, we will do a natural gas vehicle technology presentation. And then as you can see, the other ones that, that come out after that, um, um, infrastructure vehicle, vehicle on the 30th, infrastructure on the 16th of September, on the 14th, hydrogen, 28th, propane, November 11th, grant writing and funding opportunities and December the 9th, we'll be doing do's and don'ts of heavy duty battery electric vehicles. I will also mention that we, we may have um, a presentation on, um, on the uh, Lordstown Motor Endurance pickup truck coming up, although that hasn't been confirmed, but we may be doing that one as well. And once again, thanks to our uh, presenters and everybody. Thanks everyone. Take care.